King James Version, John 3, and 16, and verse 17. The scriptures will also be on the screens. John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For, son, for God sent his Son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I want to read that one more time for emphasis. John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said... Amen. I want to preach this morning from the topic, Are You Born Again? Are You Born Again? Now, every question demands a response, and the question is yes, or the question is no. And if the question is maybe, then we need to talk. (laughs) Father, would you speak now? Thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for your word, which gives life. Thank you for the newness of life that comes through the resurrection. Would you use me now to speak to this congregation? Let this word do exactly what it's been scheduled to do. Father, thank you for those who will come into the faith and those who want to be born again. Thank you for affording them the chance to be made right with you. And thank you for the cross and the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In today's passage, we observe a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus. We can start at verse number one. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. Now, here's the first thing you'll notice from this encounter that Nicodemus was referred to as a Pharisee. A Pharisee was an expert in Judaic law, customs, and traditions. The Pharisees were seen as the religious elite. They knew the scriptures like the back of their hand. The only problem is that the Pharisees did not have a good reputation. They were known for being greedy, hypocritical, and lacking justice and mercy. And they especially didn't like Jesus. You want to see beef? Read the Gospels. Because everywhere Jesus went, there was a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a scribe bumping heads with him. They did not like what Jesus stood for. They were convinced in their own way, their customs and their traditions, but Jesus came to break up their customs and traditions and to really introduce them to the God that they thought that they knew. And even in today's culture, there are people who have good intentions, but let me help you understand something about good intentions, and you've heard it before, good intentions can lead you straight to hell. You can have the intention, but just because you have good intentions doesn't mean that you made the right Move. And sometimes there are people who are zealous for things that they believe in, not realizing that they have been deceived. And when I look at today's culture, I see people who are zealous for a lot of things, and it's earnest, and it's heartfelt. But the scripture teaches us that the heart is deceitfully wicked, and sometimes your heart will lead you down the wrong path. It's got to be more than just what you feel. It's got to be a matter of of truth. And here you have this man named Nicodemus. He had all the credentials in the eyes of his people. Pharisees were hyper-educated. They had lofty roles and positions in in Jewish society. But we see something very interesting because I told you that the Pharisees bumped heads with Jesus. We see Jesus meeting Nicodemus. We see Nicodemus seeking Jesus. And um, now we get a sense of why Nicodemus is approaching Jesus at night. Look at verse number two. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, this was a loaded statement. We can assume that Nicodemus is coming by night because he doesn't want his friends to see him during the day. And I'm here to declare that even in the midst of all the craziness of our culture, there are people still seeking Jesus. See, see, when you write something on your page that lifts Jesus up, and then you have people that are commenting, 
coming against you for what you said. Listen, there are always silent people from the back end watching and wondering if what you're saying is actually true. They don't have the boldness to speak up in the thread, but they DM you. You need to know, and I, I want to help some of you because sometimes we're afraid to speak up because of all the backlash and all the negative response that people are going to have, but for every negative response, there's always someone who's considering what you're saying and thinking maybe this person is true. People are still seeking Jesus, and Nicodemus sought after Jesus. Now, Nicodemus had a lot of learning to do about who Jesus really was. So when he says that, Jesus, we recognize that you are a teacher, you need to know that that was a loaded statement. Why? Because Nicodemus himself was a teacher and a rabbi. So essentially what he was saying, you know, we know that you're not common. Um, We know you're kind of like at our level. Then he takes it a step further. He says, you know, the signs that you're performing shows that, that you have been with God. But, but understand that this is not a statement about the deity of Christ. This is just a statement to say, you know, you're kind of special like us, and we can see that you've got some supernatural revelation. And listen, perhaps you can give me some of that sauce. See, we live in a culture today that refuses to recognize Jesus as God. Many accept him as a teacher. Many accept him as a good man who demonstrated moral principles. People have no problem seeing Jesus as a metaphor of the metaphysical. Uh, seeing that, that, that it's just a story and, and, and if you apply the principles of the story, we can all be good moral people. The problem with that is that's not what Jesus claimed. He claimed that he was indeed the son of God. But, but, but in today's culture, everybody's looking for some secret knowledge to make them a superhuman. You know, the law of attraction, and if I practice the law of attraction, then, then I'll be better than everybody else around me because I got some secret revelation, and I know something that you don't know. Or, or, or if you practice these rules and these regulations, and if you follow what I'm following, if you get these crystals, and you get this sage, and you get this and that, then you can do some things in your household that ain't nobody else doing. Be careful because there are theologies that will try to put Jesus at the same level as other people and say, you know what, Jesus is just an enlightened man and he performed miracles and walked on water because he tapped into something that you can tap into. No, baby, Jesus is God. No, 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 he is the son of the living God. Jesus is not a cheat code. He he created the game. He was there in the beginning. (laughs) He was there in the beginning. Read the book of Colossians. Read the book of John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Wrapped himself in a robe of flesh. He was active in the creation. Jesus didn't just access some cheat code to make him perform miracles. No, he came from the Father himself, and they did not receive him. So Nicodemus approaches him and said, hey, man, you got the, I know you got the juice. So, so maybe you could enlighten me. And then, I don't know, maybe I can go back to my brothers, and they're kind of hating on you, but, but I, think I, could, I think I can figure you out. <laughs> they, they, they originally saw Jesus just as the son of Joseph, you know, the carpenter, because Jesus wasn't formally a rabbi. He was a carpenter by trade. He accepted the trade of his father. And, you know, Joseph, you know, Joseph, Joseph, the guy that was married to that woman named Mary, you know, Mary, the crazy lady who declared that she had had a, a child. And we all know that you can't get pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You know, that Jesus, you know, the Jesus that's making all of this trouble. See, Jesus was rejected by the religious elite, but Nicodemus was like, hey, man, you know, you and I are on the same level. And I know there's something special about you. Enlighten me. Help me understand. But, but he's going to learn that Jesus is much more than just a teacher. And I need you to understand on this Resurrection Sunday, listen, if Jesus was not the Son of God, then all of this is just theater. If, 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 if Jesus is not the Son of God, then this is just a really big social club. If Jesus is not the Son of God, then this is a sorority, a fraternity. Uh, this is all of the recreational activities that maybe you desire and the community that you see. No, 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 this is more than that. We are here because there is a historical Jesus. 
And if the crucifixion didn't happen, then we could throw all of this out the window. We are hedging our bet that Jesus is real, that he did die, that he did rise from the dead. You need to know that Jesus is not just a good teacher. He's not just a social activist. He is not a metaphorical myth manufactured by men to provide moral guidance. No, Jesus was a historical person who claimed to be God and man. He suffered a historical death by crucifixion recorded in history. He performed the historical resurrection documented by actual witnesses and has yet to been disproven. Without the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. Don't get caught up in the same trap that Nicodemus was in. See, see, People are cool with you until you declare Jesus as Lord. Because to say that he is Lord means that he is exclusive. And the moment in today's culture that you declare something exclusive, people have a problem because of our pluralistic society. But I just have to remind us on this Resurrection Sunday that Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. That was his claim, not a way, not a truth, not a life, the way, the truth, the life. And he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Those are the types of things that we're reminded on Resurrection Sunday. And so this should be etched in our heart and etched in our minds. So Jesus begins to correct Nicodemus's understanding of who he is, and he does it by teaching him something that he had never, ever considered. Look at verse number three. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, I'm looking at this from a different lens. So if Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, hey, you, you're like one of us. You, you've got some knowledge. You've got some truth. Uh, you, you've got some understanding. And, and obviously God is doing stuff through you. But, but this statement takes on a whole nother tone. See, Nicodemus wasn't dumb. He knew that a grown man could not go back into their mother's womb. So maybe he was being a little sarcastic. <laughs> Maybe he was trying to wax philosophical with Jesus, say, okay, all right, we can do this. We can go back and forth. How can a man be born again? How can he enter into his mother's womb and be born when he is old? And this is what Jesus said in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, my friends, you must be born again. First of the water, and then of the spirit. When a husband lays with his wife, And they consummate their marriage. A seed is planted into the womb of the woman. That seed begins to grow. And when it's time for that seed to become a baby and to be given birth to, the water of that woman breaks. Born of water. That's the first time you come in. But I always had a problem with that statement, YOLO, you only live once. Because how can I only live once if I've been born again? (laughs) Woo! How could I only live once if this can't be my best life now. If eternity is greater than anything I can experience here, then I should have a desire and a longing for heaven. It's not the first life I need to put all of my chips in regarding. I need to put my bet on the eternal life. So you're born once of water, second time of the Spirit Just like a husband laying down with a wife, the Holy Spirit drops a seed inside of you through the gospel preached by faith. You hear it by faith. Something begins to grow in you, and now you are born again of the Spirit, and new life is produced. When a woman is ready to give birth, her water is broken. When a person is ready to be born again, their pride is broken. Their heart is broken. 
Because they realize that they were dead in their sins. When a person is born again, they realize that their efforts mean nothing apart from Jesus. When you're born again, you have an encounter with God. You have an encounter with the Word. The Word does something to you that, that causes you to say, I've got to get right with God. And it pushes you to surrender your life to Jesus. When you are born again, something breaks. My concern is that we got a lot of folks who go to church but have not yet been broken. There's no birth without something breaking. And God is saying in this hour, I'm looking for people who are born again. See, every woman who's given birth can go back to the moment when their water broke. And every person that's been born again, listen to me, should be able to go back to the moment where their heart was broken before God. You should be able to go back to the moment when you said yes. Back to the moment where everything changed for you. If I ask you, how'd you get saved? Will you tell me about how you went to church with your grandmother every Sunday? Will you tell me about your parents' faith? Will you tell me about how you participated in youth events and youth gatherings? Will you tell me about how you sang in the choir, served on the usher board, worked a camera, helped out with Uh, facilities? Are you going to tell me about works that you did? Are you going to tell me about what Jesus did in your heart? More than ever in this culture, people need to know that you must be born again as people find even more ways to try to get people to do stuff, to achieve certain levels in the kingdom of God. You want to level up, you level down. You want to go to the next level, you submit, you surrender, you must be born again. And being born again means that there's a change in your life. When a person is ready to be born again, their pride is broken, they hear the gospel, a seed is planted, and new life is formed. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new When you are born again, you become a new something, a new creation. Uh, We talked about this earlier this morning, that that, that Jesus suffered from cancel culture. He was a public figure who had an opinion that offended people, and so they got upset, and they decided to publicly shame him. They canceled him by saying, crucify him. But yet, on the cross, at the height of his agony, he looked to the Father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He reversed cancel culture. And what he did is he canceled their debts. Because forgiveness means to cancel a debt. And anyone who's in Christ, they have their debts canceled. Listen, when you are in Christ, the old you is dead. And you have become something new. Doesn't mean that you forget where you come from. It doesn't mean that you have amnesia. In fact, it's a good thing that you can remember where you came from. And that's the problem with some of us. We act as if. We we, we act as if God is privileged just to have us on his team. We, We act as if God ought to be glad I gave him a Sunday morning. Look at me. I'm just so, God ought to be glad. I'm just such a good Christian. God ought to be glad that I'm giving my time. God ought to be glad I'm giving my money. Listen, listen, God don't need your money. God don't need your time. It's a privilege for you to come before him. You ought to be glad he doesn't reject you with your crazy self. You ought to be glad that he doesn't call to account everything that you haven't done and the things that you were supposed to do. Why? Because the righteousness of Jesus Christ covers us. The old has passed away. He has canceled the penalty of our sins canceled our debt. That's a word for someone who's wrestling with their past. When you are saved, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You have become something new. And once God has forgiven you for something, the enemy can't come back and accuse you of what you've already been forgiven for. Listen, some of y'all are just praying that the president will forgive your debts. Some of y'all been speaking in tongues. The stimulus was good. But Father, in the name of Jesus, 
Y'all ain't had a quickening in three or four years, but if you got a call that your student let, your student loans are done, you would run all up and down your quarantine home. And watch this. If my debt is forgiven, then why are you calling me? Let your student loan be forgiven, and then the debt collector call you after you got the paperwork that your loan has already been forgiven. Because once it's forgiven, it's gone. It's clean. The enemy likes to accuse that which has already been forgiven by God. When we confess our sins, he is just to forgive us. The enemy wants to do everything he can to accuse a generation. If he can't hinder you and your salvation, then what he will do is he will try to convince you that you are not loved and have not been accepted by God. When Jesus and his final work on the cross, his blood was shed so that you and I can come boldly before the throne and obtain mercy when we need it. My friends, when you're born again, your past is your past. When you're born again, you are a new creature. I love Romans 12, 1 and 2. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. And do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you understand that you are a living sacrifice, you can embrace the newness of what God wants you to become. Some of you can't become what God wants you to become because you're holding on to what the world tells you you should be. But I'm here to tell you on this Resurrection Sunday, this is the season to challenge what the world says. Because the devil was a liar back then, and the devil is still a lie. He's been lying since the beginning of time as we know it. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came so that we could have life and life more abundantly. The enemy will do everything he can to try to hinder you from abundant life, from Zoe life. But the devil is a liar. I don't have to conform to the culture. I can conform to Christ and let him make me into whatever he's called me to be. What Jesus wants to make me is good. What God has in store for me is good. No matter what my friends say, no matter what Twitter says or Instagram says or the culture says, I agree with God's plans. They are good because I serve a Savior who gave his all for me. And when he died, on the cross that blood that was shed for me is the testament of his love and his covenant if you really understood the power of that blood that you would step into the future of who God is calling you to be if you really understood the power of that blood then you wouldn't look back if you really understood the power of that blood then you would sell all that you have and follow Jesus. When I say sell all that you have, I mean divest yourself of the world's expectations and get comfortable just being weird and different and distinct from everybody else. If you really understood the power of that blood, then you would be able to drown out the cries of the crowd and understand that it's not popular opinion that drives you, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that has captured you if you really understood it. If you really understood what it means to be born again, then you would allow God to mature you into that new thing. My question for you today is simple. Are you born again? I told you that there are three responses. Yes. No. And guess what? That's okay. This is the season for us to be honest and say no. I'm not born again. But maybe you're seeking and you're inquiring and, and something keeps on drawing you back. My, my heart is that you would be able to accept this gospel that we preach. There's a reason why you're drawn. There's a reason why you're intrigued. It's because God, I believe, is pulling on your heart. And then there are those of you who say maybe. See, the thing about maybe, sometimes it's harder to say maybe than no because maybe means that maybe what we thought we were doing wasn't really legit but I'm here to speak perhaps to the maybes that this is the day for you to seal the deal and what greater day than resurrection Sunday to be able to say that was the day that I definitively surrendered my life to Jesus 
that my heart was broken for him and I allowed him to create and begin new life within me. Are you born again? Not how long have you been coming to church? Are you born again? Not whether or not you grew up in a certain denomination. Are you born again? I'm not asking if you kept all of God's rules and regulations. My question for you is, are you born again? John 3 and 16 reads, for God so loved the world. Can we just stop and pause and marvel at the love of God? In a world that's confused about love, we as Christian believers have to go to the scripture and see what God says about love. And this indicates that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten speaks of Jesus being the very essence of God the Father. This was not his adopted son. There was the son of him when a, 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 a father has a firstborn. Many times that firstborn takes on the name of that father. My only begotten son. This is my son. This flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. God gave of himself his only begotten son. He is the son of God, equal with God, not just a man. It's what we call in theology the hypostatic union, this miracle and mystery that Jesus was 100% man and 100% divine, all wrapped up at the same time. He is of God, in essence, God, the Son of God. God gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I like that word, whoever. That word, whoever, doesn't discriminate. That whoever can find the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors and the gospels, those were deemed the most sinful people, the people committing adultery. Jesus came for them. He ate with sinners. He had conversations with people that Nicodemus and his Pharisee friends refused to speak with. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is still searching for whosoever. He's still searching for the whoever. He's still searching for the people, the individuals that everybody has written off, which is why I'm saying don't cancel people just yet. It's not over until God says it's over. For every crazy thing you see in the culture, you ought to pray for salvation. Pray that the Holy Spirit will find that person that's influencing the masses. Pray that the Holy Spirit will rescue that person, that public figure that seems like they're tripping. And cra- pray, pray, pray. Because whosoever not only includes them, but it includes me. And that puts a whole other perspective on it. Because all you have to do is just reflect on who you used to be and what you used to do, the things that people could see and the things that only you knew. Then take it a step further and not only deal with the things that you used to do, but deal with the things that you still struggle with. Oh, my bad. I stepped on somebody's toes. See, some of you thought that when you became a Christian, you didn't struggle. You didn't have temptation. You didn't have things that you wrestled with. But the scripture says, it's New Testament theology, that the spirit wars against the flesh. You got two natures competing against each other. When I want to do good, evil is all around me. The things I should do, I don't do. The things I ain't supposed to do, I find myself doing. And Paul just comes to the conclusion that this is why I need Jesus. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. These are people who realize that they need Jesus, not people who are perfect, people who still wrestle with temptation, but we all meet at the foot of the cross, and we all agree on the power of the blood, and we all agree that we are sinful, and we all agree that God's way is right, and we all come with our hands lifted up, worshiping the risen Savior and declaring that we need grace and mercy. We are people of humility who live our lives recognizing that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about someone who can save anybody just like the Apostle Paul who called himself the chief of all sinners realizing that the blood was applied to you first. I like that word, whoever believes in him. And that word belief is not just a mental assent. It's not just, okay, I think this is, this is cool. No, no, no. It is the connection of heart and mind and soul. I believe. I, I believe. I believe. I accept this as true. And now that I accept it as true, I'm going to put my trust in what I heard. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
here's what gets me about today's culture. Today's culture thinks that Christians are judgmental. When you start talking about Jesus as Lord and Savior, people get a little touchy because I don't need all of that judgment. When the scripture says that Jesus was sent not to judge or condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come for condemnation. He came for salvation. Listen, he didn't come to bring condemnation. He came to endure it. Oh, he came to, to be stretched on the cross. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to absorb your condemnation. He didn't come to beat you up. He came to receive the beating. Oh, my goodness. He, he came to endure. He didn't come to judge you of your sins. He said, you could never bear the weight, so I'm going to get on the cross for myself. I'm going to receive the penalty for myself. What parent wouldn't want to step in to receive the suffering and the pain of their child? Jesus steps in and says, there's no way you could carry that by yourself. So I'll endure the condemnation. I'll take the judgment. I'll absorb it on the cross. For God sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Listen to me, church. It's God's will that none should perish. That's his will. That's his will. It literally says that in the scripture, he gave Jesus so that none should perish. Jesus didn't bring condemnation. He endured it so that we can go free. The word condemn means to pronounce guilty, which is why you can't judge a person before their time. You can't pronounce them guilty before their time because as long as there's breath in your body, there's an opportunity for you to repent and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. As long as there's still breath, in your body, there's the opportunity for you to confess him as Lord. And when you confess him as Lord, your condemnation is dealt with. The problem is that we are born condemned. We are born guilty. So we have to opt into this salvation that Jesus offers. Right now, my kitchen at home is under construction. So now when we go get groceries or we get food or we get takeout, if we leave it on the table, then it's going to perish. But in order for that to be preserved, it has to be put into the refrigerator. If you want to be saved, you got to step into the refrigerator. There, there's an action that has to happen in order for that food to be preserved. It's got to be picked up and put into the refrigerator. When we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are actively stamping into the refrigerator of salvation to be preserved for a future date. It is something that we must choose to do. But this is the problem with today's culture. They think they can do bad outside of the refrigerator. <laughs> I can do bad all by my, I can represent myself. I can take care of myself and all Jesus is offering is for you to bring all of your burdens, your heavy burdens, and he'll give you rest. Everybody is restless in their mind. Everybody's confused about who they are and what their identity is, not realizing that Jesus came to solve the issue of your identity so that you don't have to strive and perform for people who will never be satisfied, but you should know that your identity is found in Jesus. People don't realize how wonderful and how great this gift is, how awesome it is to be known by God and to know him. That's why there must be a people in the earth who publish his praises, called out of darkness and to his marvelous light so we can publish and proclaim his praises. We are a royal priesthood and a chosen generation. We've had the benefit of being in his presence and being transformed by him and people should see that. Says the sire that none should perish. And it should be your desire that none should perish. Galatians 3 and 13 shows us that Jesus did not come to condemn, but he came to endure condemnation. Verse 13, Galatians 3 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. See, here's the curse of the law. The curse of the law is you have to do the law perfectly in order for it to save you. But the problem is, 99 and a half just won't do it. Even in theory, if you were just so great and so wonderful and so awesome, and you could keep 99%, but that last 1% is enough to keep you out of the presence of a holy God. It's the problem with the law. The law tells you that you're wrong, but it has no power to rehabilitate you. 
just like those of you who roll through stop signs. That stop sign is the law. And it screams, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, every time you just roll on through it. But that stop sign can't teach you how to drive. See, the law tells you that you're guilty. Grace helps you to actually live up to the expectation that God has for you. So what Jesus did is he redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So when he hung on that cross, he absorbed our condemnation. He took the bullet for us. He died so that we can live. He took the punishment of our sins on the cross and paid our debt so that we can escape condemnation. Verse 18 of John chapter 3 says, he who believes in him is not condemned. Oh, that's real good right there. If you believe in him, you're not condemned. That's enough to shout. Take your weave off, spin it in the air, straighten it out, put it back on your head, and walk like a new person. That's enough for you to just run around this sanctuary. I had to wake you up for just a second. He who believes in him is not condemned. When I'm in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already. Hmm. He who does not believe in him is condemned already. You have to opt into this thing. Because he who has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Believe. It means to trust in Jesus, as contained in the content of the gospel. See, this trusting in Jesus is putting your faith and your confidence, your trust. See, when you trust something, you, you put all of yourself into it. Some of y'all got more faith and trust than you may realize. You, you walked into this sanctuary trusting that the ceiling would stay up. You sat down in that chair. I know me, I'm rotund. <laughs> Having enough faith and trust in this seat that if I sat in it, it would hold my weight in all of its glory. We trust in all types of stuff. Some of y'all trusting in the government. That's a whole nother message. <laughs> trusting in these fake YouTube prophets and conspiracy theories and stuff. Trust everything you read in the library. People put trust in so much. Some of y'all trust in certain hair products. Some of y'all trust in certain vehicles. You won't buy nothing else but that vehicle. We put trust in, in so much. But yet, we have not put our complete and total trust in God. See, salvation is rest. See, apart from Jesus, your legs get tired standing on your own. The weight of your imperfection is too great. Salvation is an invitation to rest in the final work of Jesus. To trust if you look at that word, believe, is to trust as contained in the content of the gospel. The content of the gospel. What are we placing our trust in? In the content of the gospel. Listen to me. A relationship with Jesus is not just a bunch of religious stuff. The content of the gospel, that we were lost in our sins, that Jesus came to be the final sacrifice for those sins, that he accomplished through his final work on the cross, salvation for those who believe that we are saved by faith through grace alone not by our works we're trusting in that and when you understand that it changes the way that you move in life so my question now as the worship team comes up are you born again I, I, don't tell me about how you remember a new vision I ain't never seen you before It happens. 
Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me that, that you grew up in the church. Don't tell me that you read your Bible every day and you say a prayer before you go to work. I need to see the receipts. You, you People say nowadays, show me the receipts. You know what the receipt is? Being able to go back and say, I remember when I confessed him as Lord. I remember when I gave him everything. I remember my life before surrendering completely to him. And I've been changed because of it. Have you been born again? Life's too short to not be born again. Life's too short to be running around playing church. Life's too short to get caught up in all these false religions. I'm not about wasting time with stuff that ain't true. And I'm just crazy enough to stand before you. I've placed my life on this belief that Jesus is Lord. I've given all of me to that commitment. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that. And I'm here to tell you that the peace that I have, the world didn't give it. The world doesn't know what peace is. The joy that I have, the world didn't give it. The world doesn't know what joy is. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes, pride of life, that's all the world offers, false peace. All them little Instagram posts that we share and these little motivation and pithy quotes and all this stuff. It's the blood for me. <laughs> and all I'm saying, listen to me, and I need you to hear what I'm saying. I read an article the other day about how people are walking away from church membership. And the article in the Washington Post literally said that people are opting to create, they treat, they treat Christianity like it's Build-A-Bear or something, like you just walk into the mall and be like, all right, I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that. All right, I want this type of stuffing. You know what that is? That's adultery. Where you, listen, you fashion God in your own image of what you want. Taking a little new age spirituality, Mix it with gospel music because you like gospel music. Add a little bit of the universe. And put it all together and say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Baby, that's not going to cut it. The question is, are you born again? And I tell you that as an educated black man with an Ivy League degree, not my education. It's the blood of Jesus that was shed for me. I'm here to tell you that as someone that's navigating the same country that you're navigating with the same issues and the same problems, salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. And I'll put my life on that. No cap. Are you born again? Are you born again? I, I mean, that's the question on the table. Now listen, here's the thing I've learned about response. God is sovereign. Those who will respond will respond. Those who won't, God can still continue to speak to you. But I can tell you life is, is not promised. It's not promised. It's not promised. A few weeks ago, a young adult was driving on her way to service. One car accident. God spared her life. I know she loves the Lord and she's on fire for the Lord. But just like that, if it wasn't for the grace of God, her life could have been done easily. Tomorrow's not promised. Today marks the one year anniversary of my mother in love, Bernice Green. Bernice Green, may she rest in heaven. Transitioned from this earth unexpectedly. Listen to me, we expected her to be here to see the birth of the baby and this and that. We had plans, y'all. Tomorrow's not promised. Life's too short. And the way this, um, this panoramic, this pandemic, this panini, this papacito, uh, the way all this stuff is, this personal pan pizza, the way all this pandemic stuff is playing out. <laughs> the long
long time since I had a personal pan pizza from Pizza Hut. Where I grew up, if you if you read all your books, you got this little card and you could take it to Pizza Hut and get you a little personal pan pizza. I digress, I digress, I digress. This thing is taking the young and the old. So I say again, are you born again? There are many who encounter Jesus and walk away sorrowfully. Are you born again? But there are those, after they had an encounter with him, he was changed. Are you born again? Are you born again? Are you born again? Father, you still have a desire that none should perish but have everlasting life. That's been your modality. That's been what you have desired. And Father, we agree with that desire. And as I've made this appeal, I pray that you move on the hearts of those who are watching, those who are in this building. If they are not born again, let salvation come to them today. They surrender everything now. They confess their sins. They say, Lord, save me. Jesus, I want you not just to be Savior, but I recognize that you are Lord. You are the Son of God, so I submit my life to you. No, I don't know everything about Scripture. No, I don't know everything about Christianity. But one thing I know is that this feeling right now is undeniable. It's more than just an emotion. God is pulling. God is tugging. The Spirit is drawing right now people unto the salvation. And the only proper response is to surrender and say yes. Yes to becoming a new creation. Yes to my sins being forgiven. Yes, yes, I say yes, Lord. That's the decree of someone, maybe just one person watching the rebroadcast, but that's the declare of a people who love you and want to be right with you. We must be born again. Father, would you save like you've always saved? Let someone be changed today. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.